Hey, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. My name is Salvador Brigman. Today, we're speaking with the team behind Rody 3, the next generation automatic tuner instrument. Um, so this basically helps you tune your guitar. And this project raised over $370,000 from more than 3,500 backers on Kickstarter. It was also the third project in which they have created on Kickstarter. Now they're on in demand. I think they're now like at 400K or something like that. Pretty crazy. But um, this guy basically came on the show to talk a little bit about the behind the scenes of what worked for them with this particular campaign, how they got funding, how they got traffic, and some of the lessons that they learned along the way. So I hope that you enjoyed today's podcast episode. You get a lot of value out of it. Um, and also when it comes to launching a Kickstarter campaign, so much of it, I think comes into, um, understanding your, your tribe, you know, your community, how you can present this in a unique way, and also how you can get people excited about what it is that you're about to announce, um, to your audience, right? So I think this team does an incredible job of marketing. Um, they've done a really good job of explaining the value of their particular product and really comparing that in some ways to some of the other alternative ways, right, of, of doing and accomplishing this product, uh, this problem, solving this problem in your life. So it's a really fascinating project and a company that's grown, I think, a lot um, in their early days. So I think you're going to like today's episode a lot. In addition, if you want to gain access to sort of my step-by-step -step launch plan for running a successful Kickstarter campaign, I got a book out there called the Kickstarter Launch Formula. Go and check that out um, on Amazon, the Kickstarter Launch Formula, or on Audible at crowdcrux.com slash kickstarter audio. And it's C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash kickstarter audio. And you will get the complete formula for launching and smashing your goal on Kickstarter, which is pretty freaking epic. Um, the other quick thing I want to say before we dive into today's podcast episode is if you're looking to join my community, you can go to kickstarterforum.org. That is kickstarterforum.org and join my community there. Of people who are looking to launch their campaigns, sharing a little bit of info about their journey, a lot of good stuff there. But without further ado, let's just jump right into it and learn how this particular creator was able to attract more than 3,500 backers, launch multiple campaigns on Kickstarter, and really grow an entire company, um, Band Industries, off of this incredible band, uh, sorry, off this incredible brand, and um, sort of learn the behind the scenes of how that works. It's coming up right after this. This podcast episode is sponsored by The Gadget Flow. The Gadget Flow reaches over 28 million people and they've been around since 2012. They are Indiegogo and Kickstarter experts. They featured over 5,000 crowdfunding campaigns. And if you have a technology or design campaign, it is a great platform to generate awareness and get backers. You can check them out at thegadgetflow.com slash submit and list your project today. Sam, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. I appreciate it, Salvador. Hey, Sam, you think we can get started? Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your relationship with the project and like what you've been doing here with the campaign. Sure. Um, so uh, Band Industries is a project that my two good friends, Bassam and Hassan, started back in 2013. And uh, they brought me on board real quick uh, to help them grow and, and uh, you know develop the product line. And since then, we've brought, let's see, three different products to market. So Rody 1, Rody 2, and Rody Base. Um, so this is our, our fourth product, Rody 3, and uh, I'm the sort of guy behind the comment section. And uh, you'll actually probably recognize my voice from the Kickstarter voiceover video. So um, I you know, work on a lot of the outwardly facing stuff and uh, help people understand what we're building and help the community uh, input as much as they possibly can uh, their awesome insights into what we're creating. How did, how did your last campaign go? You know, How does this new one differ from that? Um, well, that campaign was awesome. Uh, I mean, our, our backer community is like second to none. They are really supportive and insightful folks, and uh, they were able to get us to the 500,000 mark. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a, a, a big surprise for us. We were all prepared for, you know, we're like huge success would be 300K. Um, and we were able to raise much more than that. So we were, we were blown away and we tried to, you know, put everything, you know, in the tank and, and really bring, bring something impressive for Rody 2. Um, and for this campaign, uh, we were hoping to do somewhere right around that same mark, um, but it, obviously, you know, things changed with uh, all the the geopolitical politics as well as the U.S. politics, and uh, 
frankly, we're at this point, we're just wanting everybody to be safe. You let their voices be heard and like do their very best to be the human they want to be in the world. Because sometimes, you know, paying attention to a Kickstarter campaign isn't the most important thing. And we have to be respectful of that. And we're, we're pleased to be part of any change process that happens. So for the, the Rody 3, um, what, what is different about this, this new product that you guys have launched? The Rody 3 is kind of uh, the bigger uh, brother in almost every way for Rody 2, other than the size itself. Um, so we made it a little bit smaller, um, and then we made it really, really powerful and packed it with extra features and cool abilities. So it's twice as fast, so it'll go at 120 uh, revolutions per minute rather than 60. Um, it also is able to uh, store over 100 presets, which is over double what the previous generation was able to store. Um, it's got a beautiful color screen. Um, which is, can give a lot more information and uh, much more uh, robust sort of feedback for the for the visually uh, uh, interested individuals. Mm -hmm. And uh, also the design itself is really ergonomically um, optimized. It's curved on both ends and just kind of shaped like a long, uh, thin cylinder, kind of like a, a, a vape battery, like if anyone's seen one of those right now, um, with, a, with a tuning head coming off the top. That gives you a good mental image of it. Um, but the really cool part about it is the intelligence that we were able to pack into this thing because this is our, our second uh, generation using vibration detection. And so we've learned an incredible amount about how to optimize the, the piezo on board, um, how to remove noise, what we can and can't do with it. Like, for instance, for our tuning mode, uh, our, our sorry, restring mode, um, we now can restring and tune in one step. So you'll just you know put a new string on, hit the restring button, it'll tension the string and then tune it to the perfect ten to the perfect tuning rather than having to go exit and do menu dive into a tuning mode and then go back into it. So we're just kind of trying to smooth the whole process out and allow the device to be as uh, automagical as it can be without, you know, taking everything away and doing it behind a curtain and then showing it to you when it's done. Because yeah, yeah. A, a big part of it, it actually teaches you to, to tune as your instrument is being tuned. Like you're listening to it come into perfect tune. That's how everyone tunes their ear. That's how everyone trains their ability to tune without roadie, right? Mm -hmm. So... If people are saying, oh, you shouldn't use this, you should learn to tune, you know, yourself, this is doing both of those things at the same time, you know, so you use a tuning fork, either way, you're listening to a perfect tune and you're hearing your guitar get into that tune and, you know, Rody is a very good teacher, you know, to do that same task. Very cool. Sounds very next, like new age, kind of, um, you don't even have to worry as much about tuning your guitar, right? Very neat. Yeah, um, we'll go, let's dive back into the music, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You, you can kind of focus on what you care about, right? Um, so when it comes to the campaign, I mean, I think you guys are in a very unique situation and they've had two very successful campaigns. What would you like to pass on from that? You know, what did you learn that you really want to pass on to other people out there that are now just thinking about maybe running one? Well, uh, the first thing is good planning, obviously. I mean, that's, you don't need to hear me say it, but, um, especially the media content that you're going to plan on putting in front of the uh, campaign. Um, when you're creating a product, I'm assuming this is a hardware product. I don't have as, as good of an advice for a software launch, you know, because that's just not my, my expertise, but for hardware anyway, you know, as soon as you have a, a lookalike prototype, even if it's not act alike, you should be, you know, starting to shoot your video. You should already have ideated your video and, and begin filming it at that time. Um, just because even if you don't end up using that exact piece of footage that you create with it, it will get the process farther down the line than it ever could if you were just on paper. So start working with cameras, start working with, uh, you know, uh, sets and lighting and, and, you know, get a team together if you can afford it. But if not, just do whatever you can. It's, it's people are going to love it as long as it's, it's passionate and it's from you. It's, it's truthful. Mm -hmm. um, that actually kind of brings me to the second thing I learned a lot, which is community management um, really, really can be fun and it should be fun because these people are here to have a good time. Like this is not a strictly financial transaction. You know, this is a, a, an experience for everybody involved. And so they want to know who you are. They want to know the campaign. They want to know the project and the, and the team. And everyone tries to put that, you know, in print kind of on the campaign so you can just read it. But there's just nothing like seeing it happen live, right? So if you're interacting with them and you're just kind of doing it like you were doing it with your friend over Slack or over Skype um, and just letting them be part of your, you know, process, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's tangible for those people, you know? They like that. And so... It, it's not as stressful because you can begin trusting them to be, uh, you know, kind. You know, I think that's one of the things, too. Like, people are afraid to put themselves all the way out there because they're afraid to get attacked or something. They're not going to attack you unless you're trying to put something over on them, you know? 
Mm. Be really honest and be really truthful and be really open and like really let them be a part of the process. If there's something to hide, you're already doing something wrong, you know? So there really should be nothing to to lose. That's what I would think is is like if I'm just working on something new, I'd be afraid of people seeing like the early version because like what if they think like it just is not that good? Like what what, what about then, you know? And like fear of harming the brand or something. Yeah, they'll be completely correct. If the first version is not that good, that's exactly where you should be because the first version of everything sucks. You know, like that's almost universally true. Like you should definitely like try your best and like put as much as you possibly can, you know, into that first project, but be prepared, you know, to be on the drawing board for version two, like right away, you're going to miss something. There's going to be a new innovation. There's going to be something that, uh, you know, was unforeseen that you're going to immediately be inspired by. I kind of, I say to people, you should be pushed farther down your own road every time you take a step down it. So when you drop a product, right away you should be seeing what else it could do and like how else it could live in people's you know experiences and then try to design that new thing and so that's what we were doing with roadie uh, three as soon as we had roadie two done we're like oh what what could it do in addition to what it can already do you know so uh it's not like you should never be happy but um definitely be okay with iteration iteration is the mother Mm -hmm. of uh, perfection what are your thoughts about people who are like you've made such a cool technological product, right? <clears throat> and it's very innovative. What about people ripping you off? Like, do you feel ever scared about showing those initial iterations and stuff? If you know someone else can, you know, maybe take that and try and rip you off. So I'll, I'll tell you about it from our perspective and then I'll tell you about it from a general hardware perspective because they're very different. Um, ideally get to our perspective because this is the safe space to be. Um, we know that you can't, rip us off because we've made everything in house from the ground up. You, you can't buy our algorithm. You can't buy our PCB design. You, nobody knows how to do what we do because we designed it from, from the very beginning. And so our two co-founders are mechatronics and audio engineers. And so they birthed this thing and you can go and try to find any audio algorithm on the market. Ours is better because we have personally spent more time honing it to do exactly this task than anybody else's on the market, hands down, because you know otherwise they'd already be out there making a product with it. Um, so there's that piece of it. And then also we've got a software check with the app. Um, you have to handshake with the app to get an update. You have to handshake with the app to get new tunings. Um, I mean, you can you can make new tunings. Uh, I don't know. You can't make new tunings other than with the app. So yeah, there, there's like there's certain things. There's certain reasons why the app is uh, is essential to the 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 ecosystem. And one of them is to ensure that devices can't be spoofed. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's very, very complicated, uh, hashing that goes on between those two things. And everybody that's been doing Bluetooth code knows it's not, you know, it's not unbreakable, but it's very, very, very hard. And you really wouldn't want to do it for something like, ha hi, I can connect to your guitar tuner, you know, with my many, many times spent. Like, so, um, you know, we're, we're very pleased with uh, what we were able to do there. So that's from our perspective, from a general hardware perspective, people believe more than they should that someone is interested in taking what they have and running with it and doing it themselves because it takes a lot to build a whole company even just to launch one knockoff product you know you have to still have to design a full team around doing that so you really have to believe in it and you really have to put a lot into that and it may happen a lot more uh than than i know of because i'm only one man who's only had so much experience but from what i've seen the majority of individuals that ask you what you're working on want to help you they don't want to. They don't want to take away from you, um, especially in the Kickstarter community, and that's why I like it a whole lot. Um, you don't have to worry about you know showing people your early stuff in Kickstarter because that's what they want to know is that did you actually do this yourself? You know, do you have the work shown to make it you know your own proof when when you're done? Totally. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, that that I think helps a whole lot. Yeah, I think so too. And it's one of those things that one of the reasons why I love Kickstarter is it's so creator centric. You know, and you don't have like the business guys who are like trying to, you know, like venture capitalists and stuff. Like, I'm not really a fan of that kind of crowd. Um, so I really like that more organic, organic, authentic kind of nature um, about the site. It's, it's a hard thing to do because it's a it's an easy brand to want. You know, everyone wants to be organic and and you know, grassroots. Um, and so, and almost the desire to to have that negates the authenticity <laughs> of itself. So it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm glad Kickstarter exists. I'm glad Indiegogo exists. I'm glad that any crowdfunding campaign, you know, platform exists because 
that's a place where you can find that. And that's a place where people do have the opportunity. I mean, it's, it's their voice at the end of the day. If well, they want to be a, mm-hmm. a weird guy, they will, but you can, you can always know right away. What do you find is working when it comes to driving backers and pledges? Cause I mean, when you, when you got started, you know, um, I think things change, obviously what is working right now when it comes to getting backers for you? So in terms of ads, obviously still Facebook is the best ROI. Um, we we work with um, ad partners for campaigns like uh, Kickstarter. Uh, in our case, it's Jellop. Um, you don't have to use one. We have a very good friend who's running a campaign right now that did their own marketing for her, and uh, they just had a very, very good email list. Um, mm-hmm. Shout out to Instafloss. Those guys are awesome. Um, so uh, they had a 40,000 40, uh, person email list that they started with, and that's an excellent way to go. And it, uh, you know, was a big a testament to the people that were interested in their product because they were to generate, they were able to generate that, uh, you know, from their very beginning. So um, if you can do that, you know, have a, if you have a long ramp up and you know you're going to launch a campaign in say, you know, six months, a year, start getting emails. You know, start uh, floating out things to your friends and family in the in the small circle that you own, you know, that you own that you have. Um, you know, to uh, to see what people think about it, and if they're excited, then they'll then they'll sign up. So those emails are excellent. Other than that, I would say you know make sure you have an excellent landing page on your own website uh, that has a nice jumping off point. Uh, you know, have some uh, oh product hunt. Product hunt's a really good way. If you don't have product hunt like in your you know playbook, figure out what to do for product hunt launches. Um, we can go into that if you want to, but it's a whole kind of ball of wax of its own. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm not yeah, actually. The, yeah, I'm not. I'm not too familiar with what you would um, advise with product hunt. Just kind of curious there. Oh, so for product hunt, it's a uh, it's a real tough one because I anybody who tells you they know exactly how it works is not being truthful. Um, it's obviously a black box in terms of their algorithm. That's why but I said I don't know. Have, <laughs> you know exactly. Yeah. So, but but we what we can gather from our own empirical evidence, and this is the thing: empirical data is king here because it, it's literally all that exists. Um, that said, always take empirical data of somebody else with a grain of salt because it's not your experience. You don't know what, what went into creating it truly. Um, what we have found is that if you mobilize a large amount of individuals that are not on Product Hunt already, they make a new account and then they upvote you, you're going to trigger their, their spam algorithm. And you're, even, even though you're going to get a lot of upvotes, you're not going to increase your ranking. And the goal, of course, is to get on above 10 by the end of the day so you can go out on your newsletter and get some free marketing. Um, even so, you know the the day that you're that you're uh, hunted on there and that you're ranking, you're going to see a bump on your campaign. So, you know, mention it, but but by don't, by no means should you brigade it and say, "Hey, everybody, go to Product Hunt and like you know upvote the crud out of it." You kind of like should be a part of the community. Like if, if you want to launch a campaign, make a, make a Product Hunt campaign uh, account right now and start getting into their uh, ecosystem. Like upvote some stuff, ask some questions, understand how it works and, and make yourself a viable hunter, you know? Mm-hmm. And then when you say something on the campaign, you're having a little bit of clout. It's the same with Reddit. You know, you don't want to go on Reddit and just like make an account and post your own stuff and be self-promoting everywhere because otherwise that place would just be nothing but billboards about look at me, look at me. Um, so it's, it's tough to find the balance. Um, and w- the way that you do that is by taking, uh, you know, a sample of the community a lot, you know, to get a lot of samples, come back and back and back and see how they interact with each other. And then you're going to be able to, you know, open your mouth without making a, make a fool of yourself. So that's, that's what we were, we've been doing. And, uh, you know, it worked okay. We didn't make the top 10 ranking this time. We, I think we ended up at number 12 with uh, 200 and something up votes. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, it, it was a good bump for the campaign and, uh, I really like again. I like talking to people, so there's more comments, more time to talk about the product, more time to you know hear people saying they're excited, and I'm like, all right, man, right on. I'm so pumped to get it to you. So it's like, you know, it's all enthusiasm. It's all momentum. You got to get it where you can. So you you have the the roadie tuner right, and then the roadie two. Am I right? Mm-hmm. Those two. When when were they launched? We have the roadie base also. So. The Rody three, uh, sorry, the Rody uh, tuner, normal one, was launched in 2014 with a Kickstarter campaign in 2013. Um, then Rody two was launched in 2017. Rody base came slightly after in 2018 because we were still finalizing the piezo stuff to do the low register. It was tougher to get the lower register working perfectly than mm-hmm. it was the higher register. Um, so 2018 for Rody base, and then uh, we're going to be releasing Rody three in 2020. It's about a two year gap there kind of 
Yeah, three, three year between the major updates of Roadie Roadie One, Roadie Two, and Roadie Three. What What are you doing, like in the meantime, from like a company standpoint? Just out of curiosity, because I think you're sharing, you know, a lot of great tips here. I just was just curious about like the internal workings of the company. So as you you know you launch the campaign, you're fulfilling and stuff. Like what happens during those those two years? Are you preparing for the new one? Are you working on new stuff? What are you doing in that time? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, like I said, the moment that we finished Roadie 1, we started working on Roadie 2, and the same with Roadie 3. Um, we always, I mean, there's basically, we're so this is, back up two steps. Our, our, our company is technically um, wealthy. Um, almost everybody in the company is technically savvy to some degree. Um, because of that, our, our technical team is very big, and their ability to work within the company is very uh, large, and so... We have a good agility. And so because of that, um, when the designer wants to work with a new potential for a product idea or a new um, a feature set, they can just sit with the engineering team and talk about it and speak their own language rather than having it sort of go through these many, many stages of approval of one team and then going over to the other team and have it be shot down for some basic-ass reason. You know, mm-hmm. So there's stuff like that that we save a lot of time on. Um, but you know, we're, we're always trying to find you know, the next project and then we'll take the technical team and we'll have one uh, half of it work on uh, optimizing and upkeep of the current generation and then the second half of it be looking at the next uh, horizon and how we can get there. It's similar to how some of the development at Apple happened, except we don't pit them against each other or keep anybody in the dark. Yeah, Yeah, that's that's definitely a plus there. Um, That's so interesting. So sort of like half of you is working on fulfilling and making sure the customer's having a good experience. The other half is kind of looking to the future, sort of. That's that's hard to do staffing-wise. I mean, that's an expensive bet, but we found it to be paying off um, really well because we're able to have a pretty decent product cycle in terms of time frame. Um, and, dude, this, this time next year, we're going to have a conversation about some really, really exciting stuff that we will have already told everybody about that I can't tell you about yet. So we, we have... Are you looking for help with the fulfillment side of your rewards on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or any other crowdfunding website? Fulfillrite is literally the gold standard when it comes to crowdfunding reward fulfillment. These guys will help you ship out your products, your packages, your orders to all of your customers and your backers. They've been working in this industry for a really long time. I totally vouch for their services and they'll even do things like answer several questions for you on fulfillment and shipping and figuring out how to get your products into the hands of your customers in the easiest way possible. If you're interested in learning more about them, you can go to fulfillright.com or crowdcrux.com slash fulfillright, and that will take you to them. Again, that is F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E.com. You know, incredibly fun stuff in the pipeline always. Um, and we feel like that's kind of our, uh, our, it's our, it's our manifesto, right? You know, we, we say to people, Hey, we're here to make the musician's toolkit. We're here to make the musician's lives better. You know, we have to then innovate. We can't just say, Hey, look, we did it like a better tuner. You're welcome. Done. You know, yeah. it's, it's gotta be, because we're musicians, you know, I sing, uh, our two co-founders are flautists and, uh, Ode players, uh, respectively. Ode is like a, a 12 string guitar style instrument of the Middle East area. And, um, you know, we have, all kinds of different musicians, you know, some of the people are mostly mostly instrumental to the point where they make their own whole albums, you know, and, and play every instrument. Mm. So it's like, we care so deeply for the community that we're serving. Um, it's, it's our joy and passion to continue to innovate in it. You know, it's, it's what we want to do. It's like when you wake up in the morning and you're done and you didn't have to do anything, you want to go dive deep into your hobby. And then when you find the end of it, like, bust through it and like make something new and fresh and special and cool. So we just did that professionally. Yeah. I, one of the things that I think sets out your company from other ones I've come across is that you're very focused. Um, and yet you also have a lot of energy. How do you decide to like on the, the feature set of the next new products? Cause I'm sure you have so many product ideas, right? That you guys, that you guys could create and innovate in the music space. Is there any kind of way that you narrow in on what you really want to put into the product or what to leave out? Officially, I'll I'll just say that it's like, you know, well reasoned and thoughtful discussion. But unofficially, there's lots of shouting. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, you know, we're all we're all so passionate about this that we have uh, very very strong opinions. And so the next product, 
um, comes at the heels of maybe three solid weeks of meeting around maybe a couple good candidates, you know, because this is going to be the next number of years of the company's uh, dedication. So we all want it to be something that's going to be impactful. It's going to be, you know, good for the bottom line. It's going to sort of push forward what we've done thus far. It's going to bring in more people into the fold, you know. So all these things have to be taken into account, as well as is it beautiful, you know? Does it does it technically add more stuff, you know? Because we want to also like use the newest you know, gear, you know, we want to use piezo detection. We want to use USB-C. We want to use beautiful little color screens. Like it, it has to feel like you're using current generation technology when you're, when you're playing music, I think, uh, in, in order for uh, to be truly innovative, you know, I, that's not true. That's not true. True innovation can come in any form. I take that completely back in our vision of innovation. That's how we've chosen to do it. That's what I'll say. When it comes to that, I was going to ask that question next, actually, when it comes to technology, are you thinking about like, more of the way I would think, which is like the entrepreneur, what's the problems I face when I play guitar? What are the ways we can come out those problems? Or are you looking more at like the cool technology? What can we do with it? Or is it just kind of like off the wall ideas? What are your thoughts on that? Um, it's very much a, a smoothing process. And so um, music music is a river, right? It, it meanders and flows. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's things that don't halter that or halt that flow in certain ways. So like tuning obviously was one. We found that some people won't tune on a standard because they're afraid of getting their instrument back into standard. And so they're stuck. Um, so uh, that was one reason why Rody uh, was so focused on alternate tunings is we want to sort of break through that barrier mentally for people to say, listen, this is what you play. Um, but, you know, what you play could mean literally anything as long as you were able to redefine it comfortably. Um, the other one is just time savings, you know, so you get people back to playing and not worrying about tuning or listening to someone tune forever. Um if you're if you're a, a studio person, dude, I mean you can burn thousands of dollars just waiting for one egotistical guitarist to tune up because they won't receive help, or blow a bunch of takes because they refuse to receive somebody else's help tuning their guitar and it was actually out of tune. Mm. So it's like with a tool that takes it out of the social realm and into the technical realm, just saying, hey man, have you seen this? Check this out. Zip 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 zip. Okay, let's go. And so you've just shown them something new. They ha they don't have any reason to resist, um, and then you get to go on with your world, you know. So anything we can do to help that process move forward. I mean, like music takes many, many, many forms, and so the ways in which people need to, you know, have that you know smoothing out process happen are, are legion. And so we're just trying to, you know, fit as many in as we can without it feeling like bloated or something. Because it's easy to do that too, right? Mm -hmm. You could have a Swiss Army knife, hundred knives on it, won't fit in your pocket. Yeah, so the same yeah. thing with like a menu. Dive so deep in it, you can't figure out where the thing is you want to do. It's like all of a sudden that thing goes in the kit bag and doesn't come back out. Seeing, seeing as you do have such a, a strong community, do you have any thoughts on the, like the ways you engage that community? Are you, for example, like having people submit songs that they write, or are you um, showcasing musicians at all? Like, how do you engage the community aside from just saying, "Hey, we made a new product for you." So uh, we have a really active blog, um, and what we do with our blog is, I think what a lot of people times when you read a, a company blog, it's almost <laughs> boring. possible yeah. <laughs> to the company from the blog. And so it's like, dude, I know you make this thing. I've like seen it a million times. Like, Can we get on with it? And so we try to make our blog just why we are passionate about music, the stuff that we're interested in, and what you'd be sharing with other people if you actually went on Facebook, which I don't. Um, so it's like, you know, this is the place where we can finally talk about music with people that are passionate about music and, you know, be like, oh, man, isn't it amazing that Ingrid Malmsteen plays this or that a track and this or that is, uh, you know, a tuning or, you know, did you realize that uh, when you go on stage with Mark Farner, you have to be in 4 3 2 or he'll kick you off even if you're a keyboardist? It's like there's these weirdo things that like that's that's fascinating for us and it has nothing to do with tuning a guitar, but if you like tuning guitars, there's no way you don't want to know that fact and talk about it and, and learn about it and be in the comment section. So it's like, that's a good way to do it. Um, you know, past that, we just kind of speak through our hardware. We really do just make whatever we think will give people the, the best feeling of, uh, of innovation and time savings and uh, ease of use. And then, uh, try to try to bring it to them in a way that doesn't seem like it's hammering down at their throat. I mean, yeah. we, 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 uh, I do word of mouth marketing as much as possible. So Kickstarter is like, you know, the Shangri-La of word of mouth marketing kind of. Mm -hmm. um, we just want people to hear about it from their friends and their other musician buddies, not from like a billboard or a magazine splurge or something like that. It's like, oh man. So this is, this is kind of a tangent, but tell me if you think this is a cool idea. We think it might be a good idea to, rather than doing buys on traditional marketing, 
just invest in the customer's experience. So like go places where we know they're going to be and do something for them that they might appreciate. I mean, like, Hey, like this is our marketing budget. We're spending it on you. So oh, yeah, you know, totally. physically feel it rather than being like, Oh, you're nice. Like you clogged my Facebook feed with like a hundred roadie ads. Cheers guys. I know you make roadie. Well, you know, like, so- like Virgin records, right? That, that brand is so much about experience and, you know, Richard Branson just paying attention, not just selling records, but making a fun, comfortable environment to enjoy the records. Right. It's almost yep. like a fun place to be, whereas other record stores would just usher the customers out very quickly because they don't want them to linger around. Whereas he was like identifying, oh, it's more about the experience. So I could totally see that that working pretty well. I like I also have some content here, like how to make your own instruments from recycled materials, you know, how to teach your kids yeah. how to play guitar. So it really goes beyond just you know pushing the product. Right. We want we want to be it sounds even cringy to say it, but like we want to be buddies, you know, we want to actually be a part of these people's musical experience. We know that we're a community of musicians and that we're kind of on the outside as a, as a product creator, but you know, it doesn't have to be that way as long as the product creator isn't being all weird and pushy. So we're trying not to be all weird and pushy. Yeah. Very smooth. Very smooth. Um, so my, my last question for you here has to do with your early bird specials and deals and that kind of stuff. What is your approach to that? So that was the the other thing that I learned from this campaign. Uh, we did that wrong. Uh, I'll be the first to admit it. Uh, the guys on the, uh, the the backers on the campaign were were um, quick to point it out too. We um, we needed more than we need, than we had last time. Obviously, we we, we were going to put more uh, early bird and super early bird backers uh, you know, uh, perks down, mm-hmm. but it went in ten minutes. You know, all of them, all fifteen hundred, instantly gone, and we were like, oh, "Okay, that that's not how that went last time." Um, and you know, at, at that point, you've, your your bed is done. You know, you basically you've made it. Whatever it is, you have to lie in it. And so, we didn't we we didn't think about the fact that the Australian backers were going to wake up to nothing. We didn't think about the fact that the Japanese backers, the overseas backers, all over the place that weren't you know waking up at eight a.m. and ready to hit the button. Even some of the people that were. You know, it was just so fast. And like one guy, the power went out in New York and all the cell phone towers and everything in the entire, you know, a- area went down for 10 minutes. And then he gave, got back and he missed it. So I was like, oh, my God. So, you know, we – I'll tell you why we – I'll tell you what mistake we made and how I would fix it and what they should do if, if they were me in the past. So um, I got a lot of emails from people saying, hey, you're going to run a campaign. You know, you should do this. You should do that. Like, use my tool. There's so many Kickstarter tools, especially when you first start it, right? Um, mm-hmm. They tell you they're going to help you with your backer kit or your pledge level, or your logistics or whatever. They, they think you have no idea what you're doing. And you're like, yeah, whatever, buddy, whatever, whatever. I got this. Well, one of those people, I forget the name of the company, and I'm not going to you know, try to give them some sort of cheap plug, but they help you uh, top up your, uh, your early bird specials to keep them available for people. So there's always a few there. There's a sense of urgency. And the people can, you know, can get them. Now, the downside is that means that you're spending a lot more money giving people, you know, cheaper deals on your product. But at least they actually get the chance to have it, um, you know, and, and they can, you know, buy it at their super early bird rate if that's going to be the deal breaker for them. So, you know, we should have done it that way. And, and I can't go back and I can't redo it because people have already spent money and it wouldn't be mm-hmm. fair to those that have already, you know, done that. And so it's like I just had to live with the shame of that mistake and, like, try to do well by them in other ways and, like, just acknowledge that and tell it to anybody who'll ask, like, yeah. do that better than we did. You if, know, we, did you, it, we didn't do it right. If you guys are interested in that tool, by the way, it's um, crowdcrux.com slash stock limits. I think that's the one you're referring to. Yep. Yeah. Uh, just as a shameless plug, <laughs> but it'll help, it'll help support the show. It's affiliate link. Right. Um, well, good. But anyway, so continue on. Yeah. So, um, you know, that was, that was one thing that we could have done better. Um, but in general, the early bird backers and the super early bird backers, they're there for a reason. You know, these people are not people that just, you know, have a lot to spare and decided to try to save that 10 bucks. Usually it's the people that it was the actual difference between owning the product and not owning the product. And that was made very clear to me. And I really feel that, you know, like I want those people, whoever commented, if they listen to this podcast, sorry, you guys, like, I, I feel that pain. We're going to do our best to make it, you know, up to you guys in other ways. You know, we really do want you guys to know that you're heard. So that's, that's what I can say to that. You know, we got to live with our, with, with our, uh, our learning mistakes and then go forward. It's like, it's, it's tough in life, but you learn most from your mistakes. You know, it's like, it's hard to go back and redo exactly the success that you did before because sometimes it's not as clearly burned into your mind as the times you messed up yeah yeah definitely 
And it's one of those things too, where you, you live and you learn, right? And it's, it's kind of inspiring. I think that even though you guys are a huge established company with, you know, multiple campaigns that are successful, you're still learning at this. Yep. Yeah. Well, it changes too. I mean, like these tools weren't available last time I ran a campaign, so I didn't think about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's, it's one of those things as well, where, you know, you learn about your customers and you're, you're continually learning and each new product is different, right? So you're always getting feedback and you're always getting people who have comments and questions and just kind of like, it's a whole, that's what Kickstarter is. It's a whole learning process It's a customer discovery, like journey. Absolutely. In my yeah, our, our, our team includes Kickstarter. They helped us make our products, you know, and we always, you know, uh, tell anybody that asks, like, we're a Kickstarter success story because if it wasn't for the innovation that those, uh, you know, early backers helped us, you know, figure out, we don't know where we would be right now, you know? And so the fact is they're, they're an indelible part of our path and we'll always be very happy, happy and thankful for that. On that note, where can people go to learn more about the project? Um, so you can go to roadiemusic.com to check out uh, our website, and uh, from there you can jump off to our Kickstarter campaign, which is the Roadie 3 Automatic Guitar Tuner. Awesome. Well, I just want to take a second to to thank you for bringing you know, a level of transparency and authenticity to the show. It's very refreshing, and I really appreciate it. Um, we can really? I can give you the last word here. If you'd like to speak to other creative types or entrepreneurs or you know product designers, maybe a final tip or a word of encouragement, a bit of advice, motivation, anything like that. Um, yeah, put yourself in the product and the campaign because people want to know who you are and they want to be a part of your life through their experience with your product. And that's hard to do. It feels very personal. Sometimes it's not as comfortable as you'd like it to be, especially if you're a private person. Um, let this be a moment of growth for you because it is something that you're sharing with the world and it is something that you can be and should be proud of. And people want to help you experience that joy. That's why they want to uh, experience that personal side of, you know, who made this thing. So let it, let it come out, let it, you know, let it out into the world and, and you'll be really pleased with what happens. Thanks, Sam, for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. And good luck with your remaining days. Absolutely. Thanks, Salvador. Thanks a lot, Salvador. Have a good one. Hey, thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystify podcast. My name is Salvador Brigman. This episode really tried to dive in deep. And I think um, when it comes to launching a technology gadget or a gizmo, that this episode shared a lot of good stuff that you can implement into your own crowdfunding campaign. So I hope you took away some good lessons and tips and tidbits from today's podcast episode. In addition, if you'd like to get access to me and do a intensive one long hour long coaching call where we kind of go through your entire project, your strategy, the milestones, your things you got to do going forward. Um, I really try to have these coaching calls be educational, informational, and also um, tailored to you and your specific category, your specific project and industry. So if that sounds interesting to you, you can go to the link I'm about to mention and book a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me. That link is crowdcrux.com slash coaching. That is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X dot com slash coaching. Just go to that link, book a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me, and we can get that squared away ASAP. Again, crowdcrux.com slash coaching. Thank you for joining me on today's episode. Go and check out some of the other episodes we got out there in the archives of the Crowdfunding Demystified show. Also got the YouTube channel by the same name. Just Google me um, on YouTube. And finally, we got Crowdcrux, which is my blog. I think you can get a lot of great value there as well. And also kickstarterforum.org. Thank you for, for tuning in to this episode, and I will see you next time.